If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Blah blah blah. The blah blah blah. Sending out good vibes. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Hey guys, welcome back to the America Show. We're going to be chatting with Tony Merkel a little bit later uh, about his uh, media company, Merkel Media, and specifically, mostly about uh, Skinwalker Ranch stuff. This is what we mostly dig into this. That was a fun chat. If you want to skip our lazy ramblings, of course, there's always a timestamp in the show notes. You can just click on that and I'll skip right ahead to the interview with Tony, but then you'll miss all this shit. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. And we got everybody's favorite podcaster, Graham, my first real winter Dunlop. How's it going? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. How you doing? This was a great chat with Tony. I mean, the, the, he's out there hunting the dog man right now as we speak. We just did a union of the unwanted on the, para, on the paranormal. And tonight we recorded it. Or we live streamed it. And he was going to be there, but he couldn't make it because he's hunting the dog man. I mean, we had this chat about the dog versus the dog man and. And the skinwalker, I mean, it's super fascinating. What a what a fascinating dude. He's been doing the confessionals since 2016, I think, 2017. I mean, it really just having people tell their stories about their paranormal experiences. And it just blew up. He did really well with the podcast. Now he started his own media company where he's making kind of documentaries and movies. And he's going out and doing this stuff with a crew. He's got a good crew of people that he's, he's doing this with. So, yeah, it's turning it into a pretty cool business. Nice. There you have it. I was hunting ducks today. Not oh, yeah, we do have a hunting hunting update. Do we? I just been hunting ducks mostly lately. Lots of ducks. Pheasants. Mostly ducks. It's good duck time weather. You know, it's cold, freezing, a little below freezing. The ducks are cold. They like the cold. They're fatty. Really, eh? So mostly just hunting ducks. Getting ready for the big elk hunt. Just a couple days away. I went duck hunting a bit this weekend, but now that's about it. Uh, for at least a week. Zoo rev up for the big elk hunt starts this week. We got uh, the Brit coming into town in just a couple days. Now, I think Wednesday. He gets here Wednesday night. So he must be leaving like England Wednesday morning, which would be Tuesday night. So he's like leaving right away. Yeah. Heading over here. We'll drag him out to the, uh, the army base hunting for a couple days. The Canada's area 51 to hunt elk. Canada's <laughs> area 51 to hunt elk. And then we'll, uh, take him out duck hunting, all that sort of stuff. And then we'll sell into, uh, the event is only a week and a half away. There's still time to get tickets and come if you want. There's still a couple spots probably. There is still a couple spots left. You could jump on right now and you could get a spot and you could come and hang out with us in just like two weeks' time. Yeah, less, less than two than weeks time. Less than Round that. Round and Powell, have a time out to Hot Springs, maybe shoot some skeets, all that fucking fun. We're going to have a blast, go through the two national parks. You just got to get your ass to Calgary. We'll take care of the rest. Contact at thecabin.com if that is something you'd like to get into. That's a little too quick for you. You could jump on one of those other two. Check them all out. Check them all out while you're there. Yeah, the Eclipse, the Eclipse of the Canyon. This is the Path of Totality. A little festival with the Brothers of the Serpent in Texas, right in the Path of Totality. It's uh, There's still uh, some early bird tickets available. I think the first hundred are at a discount. So that's also at contactedthecabin.com. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a blast. I hope it's not a little festival. Hopefully it's a big festival. Yeah, Are you ready well, for a real winter? No, it's not going to be a, like, it's, there's not thousands of people there. That's a big festival. Is that a big fest? Yeah. I think we have 400 tickets. That's not big. 
No. That's low? No, that's low. There you have it. I think. You know what can happen? It's like little stock. Yeah. I do want to mention something before I forget. Uh, did you hear about that hurricane in Acapulco? That's where an, a narcopulco is. Like, that's sort of one of the freer, sort of freer areas in, in Mexico. And uh, it, it turned into a Cat 5, like, within hours and just rocked the place, destroyed a bunch of things, a bunch of looting and some crime and fucking craziness. So, um, Charlie Robinson's uh, co author, Jeff Berwick, who also happened to produce the film that we have recorded an episode about that uh, the episode help me out here. What's the, f- the film that we just recorded the episode about the skinwalker? No, the other one. He was also, Jeff Berg was also supporting that film that we, uh, Oh, the, uh, and all that. the one with the uh, plantation with legal. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's recorded on Outlawed. I think the video will be out there for, on Outlawed. But yeah, we we interviewed the the producer of that or the I guess the the creator of that film. But Berwick was helpful producing that too. So he set up a this isn't like a Clinton Foundation thing or anything, but he set up a fund to help people to get them water and generators and all kinds of stuff uh, over there. It's called Hurricane Otis Recovery dot com. So if people can feel like helping out at that uh, disaster spot right now. There's a link in the show notes to that hurricane notice recovery.com. I just heard about it tonight. So very strange happening though. I mean, it's kind of weird how it got it, it snuck in and the mainstream media is not talking about it at all, which is weird. Like, you think it was attack? Kinda. Yeah. I think it was like an example of what they could do to the freedom community or something. Oh, you think it's about the freedom community, not like China? I don't know. I just, I just, that's where my head goes with everything now. It's terrible. Should it be the shape of shadows? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Are you going to play this, the trailer? Yeah, we might as well get that done, eh? Play the yeah. trailer for the movie. This movie we're going to talk about. Of course, this podcast called The Confessionals, right? Yeah. All right, let's see if this works. grandfather too you would tell the same story in that same area there was a horse like a horseman so there definitely is that that creature out there so they say these things can turn into wolves they turn into right. you know, different creatures cougars whatever whatever's available my name is tony merkel host of the confessionals podcast i've interviewed over 500 witnesses to the strange and unexplained last year i assembled a team of like-minded guys to come with me on a quest to document and even possibly experience some of these mysterious phenomena for ourselves. We started getting lights out here over the ridge. Here they come again. Here they come again. That gray container was right here. Correct. Look left, look left. Yeah. Up there? They'll come from the west. No, it's in the sky. So it's old news. It's old news, yeah. This kind of stuff is connected in some way. What if those guys, whoever it was, that was a decoy? God created everything, yeah. including these UFOs, including all those phenomena. God created it all. Yeah, that was an awesome movie. I mean, it, that is just a, what a place that is, that Skinwalker. I mean, it's just so crazy, dude. It's wild, wild thing. Yeah. Wild thing. Yeah, it was a fun chat with Tony. He seems like a good guy. Well, let's hang out with him sometimes. I mean, we do need you guys to support the show. GrandAmerica.ca slash support this is a value for value podcast. If you guys are getting some value from our show here, I think this is episode like 626 or something. All there, all for free. No commercials. Head over to GrandAmerica.ca slash support today. Sign up for monthly. Make a one-time donation. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's just down. Some of you guys can help it out. Maybe one of you has got at least one of you has to sign up this week. One of you has to go sign up for a monthly or make a one time donation. Of course, you can support the show by heading over to our other podcast over at GrandAmericaOutlaw.ca or AdultBrain.ca and sharing those around and telling your friends about all these podcasts we're doing so that maybe they can find one they like and thus uh, support it down the road. And you've done your part. Yeah, that really helps too, for sure. I mean, we. 
we're going to talk about it in Outlawed because we're going to do a YouTube thing, I think, because we had another episode. It looked like we had another episode removed, right, from YouTube. I mean, it, honestly, the discoverability is just almost gone now. So we need, like, our market, the best marketing is you guys to, to help us out, spread the word, pass it around. We're going to do the struggle session on the free yeah. Outlawed, I think. Right? Just... The free Outlawed roundup. Yeah. Do you yeah, know we're, how doing, we're doing more of more shows just ourselves going over stuff that is not getting covered in places. So we can come, over to to and see it. come over to Outlawed and check it out. We got a lot of lazy ramblings over there. If you guys like these intros, it's just that, except talking about current events, COVID vaccine stuff, all that kind of Canadian stuff. Canadian politics. Canadian politics. Kind of. I mean, not really, but just touching the surface of that. A little bit. Canadian culture. Canadian culture, let's say. So you, uh, did you live in Montreal? Uh, no, I was born in Montreal. So you just lived in, in BC and Alberta? No, no, no. I lived in Quebec for eight years, seven years. Yeah. When you were like a little kid? Yeah, I remember, I remember it well. Yeah. yeah. Are you ready for a proper winter? Well, what? The- I mean, that Saskatchewan winter is going to be a motherfucker. It feel, you know what? It feels like it it, it froze and then it hasn't thawed. Like, it's not like gonna. I was saying. Like I was saying to you in Alberta, like there's a month or two on both sides of the season where it just melts every day, like freeze, melt, freeze, melt, freeze, melt. There's no, there's no melting. It's just no schnooks either. There's not going to be. That's what I mean. There's no. Days. It's just like it's frozen and that's it. This is this, this winter's here and that's it. You're stuck. Yeah, that's a proper winter. Oh, yeah. No, I remember those huge snow banks and we'd play and I mean, we had proper winters there too. Well, here you're not going to get so much snow. It's just going to be cold as fuck. This seems worse though. There was lots of snow here last year, but it it, it seems colder than back east though, isn't it? It must be colder in Saskatchewan than back east. No, I don't think so. It's pretty cold back east. Because it's more, isn't it more humid and doesn't it, isn't it less cold because of the humidity back there even through the winter too i don't know no i don't think so it's cold it's fucking cold no matter minus 40 is minus 40 but it does put calgary in a better like it really calgary is really as far as like anything east of the rockies calgary has got the best climate probably in the winter winter. up north yeah Yeah. summer's hot too yeah sunny i think we're the sunny one of the sunny cities in the world bro yeah, I know. I noticed that here too. I thought it was like that here too, but there's more clouds here for sure. So yeah, check out the, the Outlawed Roundup. Check it out. We need you to check out Outlawed Roundup. We're gonna keep it short and sweet this week, but we got these Outlawed Roundups. We need you guys to check those out and uh, share those around too. Like, see, we got these trips coming up. We got the elk hunt this weekend. And then we'll settle back into the winter routine. We are gonna be doing more of those roundups weekly. So. Check all those out. Settle into winter in Grand America. Yeah. Do you got bio? I already, I already took care of the bio. That's it. Yeah. I don't spam Graham. No one spams Graham anymore. <laughs> I just don't read them. I maybe I'm getting lots of emails. I just don't read them for his britches. Actually, I'm saving a good. E- I, well, you know, I get some interesting emails sometimes. I sometimes they're too esoteric to read. But. Too esoteric to read. Yeah. Actually, I got a good one about that. Uh, well, I, I can't even say it on here. We'll wait. We'll wait for the roundup. It's about the, the roundup. All, everything's censored now these days. Anyway, yeah. come on the trip with us. Come hang out with us in BC. Other than that, uh, we'll be back next week with the regular show. I mean, this is kind of regular. It's only it's fifteen minutes. Usually, we do a little longer, but we're doing these outlaws now. It takes a lot. Of our uh, jibber jabber, out in these forty-five minute outlaws that you guys can be checking out while we bitch about the news <laughs> and all that kind of fun stuff, and all yeah. our friends that uh, getting weirded out from COVID jabs. I mean, it's just terrible, <laughs> terrible. But what's not terrible is this chat with uh, Tony Merkel from Merkel Media. Worth checking out his film. Worth checking out his podcast. Right now, check out his chat, Tony Merkel.
Oh, are we live? Yes. Here cheers. we go. <laughs> Again, <laughs> caught off guard. Tony, thanks for joining us. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, the the confessionals. I mean, I have a friend of mine. Big shout out to Rye. He's he just started up his own podcast, and you've been an inspiration for him. He moved to ex, uh, Mexico, but he wouldn't stop talking about your show. He's like, "Oh, the confessionals! You got to listen to the confessionals." Oh man, and, I shout out to Rye. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's because it it was like I think what we saw early on of our show is people wanted to tell their stories. Like people were interested in like, hey, finally somebody's listening to my personal stories. Yeah. Of like whatever spiritual awakenings, UFOs, cryptids, whatever, whatever it was that that sort of was still getting, you know, it was kind of the era of the the new atheist too. And there's a big skeptical push against all this stuff. And you know, back when politics wasn't pop culture, you know, when there was a battle over the paranormal, you know, yeah. so people wanted to tell their story, and that was kind of like the gist. I mean, maybe we'll get into the the background on why you started it, and and the, the you know you've come so far since then, but maybe we can hit that for a sec. Yeah, no, I can talk about whatever you want, man. Uh, it, it's definitely come a long way. Uh, when I started in 2017, I, my logo uh, was just clip art that I pulled off Google Images because I was like, I don't know if this is actually going to work and last. And so um, <clears throat> it, it, that's how the whole shush finger even happened. I, I, uh, I put, It was some gray, like artistic face that I had and pulled off and it was doing the shush and i was like oh that kind of works you know confessionals you're confessing what you experience you're not supposed to talk about this stuff and uh, i just slapped a circle around it put the confessionals and that was the first logo and then uh the show kind of took off and that's when i was just like okay so i guess i should probably actually come out with a logo and so i did the black and white logo where the uh the 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 one eye was covered and i was doing the shush and then i got everybody saying that i was a psyop and that i was trying to <laughs> I was part of the Illuminati and all that stuff. I'm like, no, it's just my friend in Hawaii who's an artist did it. And I thought it looked cool and he did it for free. So I was just like, let me, let me, let me get that. So uh, that's, the, that was how the whole thing came together. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been pretty wild for sure. And have you, was your goal to sort of just, just to have people on to tell their stories about this kind of stuff or did you yeah. always have an interest in this? No, I, I mean, yeah, definitely had an interest in this stuff. Uh, you know, I, I find that ADHD is a big cop out or an actual reason for why I do it, what I do. But it's it, I always bring it back to that because it, it just it's true. Uh, and I, I feel like growing up and stuff, the ADHD nature of mine just kept me moving from subject to subject. Uh, but it was always this weird cryptid stuff. And I loved watching like these haunting shows uh, with you know, it's like uh, the shows where they're talking about paranormal activity in somebody's home and then they cut to the actual person where they're interviewing the person and talking about, and that person's actually sharing what they experienced. And they're like, yeah, it crawled up the wall kind of thing. I'm just like, that's the person I want to hear from. We don't need to worry about the reenactments. We don't need to worry about the investigation. Like I'm not interested in the investigation because if you actually uncovered something amazing, we would have heard about it on the news already. And so let's just talk to the person who went in through that. And uh, that's how I always felt about it. And then with the podcast, when it came up, I was just like, that's how we're going to do it. When I, when I started the podcast, though, I really felt like I was, uh, I had, a, I had to interview people. And so I didn't know how to do that former truck driver. So I, I tried being like a journalist with it. And I was just like, I'd, I'd get somebody's email, I'd read it. And okay, I want to talk to this person, I'd call them. And talk to them about their experience. I'm like, okay, yeah, I want them on the show. Then I redo that whole thing again. I have all these preset questions, and I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, like this is just not me. I don't know how to do this. Like, it, I felt like I was fumbling over everything, and so I just scrapped that whole that whole method of trying to, you know, be professional. And I was just like, I'm just going to do what I do, which is I talk to people, and um, and I just kind of adopted that, and I. At that point, I decided that I wanted to one day become the Joe Rogan of the paranormal and just kind of sit down with people. And this is 2017, you know, so like uh, it was before Joe Rogan was like uh, chastised by half the country for silliness. Uh, but I, I was just that's what I wanted to be. And so that's what I set out to be. And I decided just kind of let myself be who I was, which is just a, a, a yapper. And that was the hardest thing, I think it was to 
learn that people need to be able to share their experiences. And the more I can let them just share without being interrupted, the more uh, entertaining it is for everybody else. So that's what I try to do. Uh, sometimes people, they're just not really, they're not really used to sharing these experiences with people. They're not used to talking on a recording, but that's just the fact that they know that they're being recorded. It kind of like messes with them. And so sometimes you have to kind of you're five minutes in and you're trying to encourage them to to continue the conversation and kind of goes back and forth a lot. It's just funny when you see the reactions to people sometimes because they're like, you know, you need to stop talking so much. Let the guests talk. I'm like, uh, I would. I would. But uh, they need help. And so that's why we're talking. You know, uh, there's the, like the, the you'll, you, you'll hear that on one week and then the very next week will be like a two hour interview where I talk maybe five minutes, you know, and it's just like, I'm good with whatever, whatever the, that person needs. And I always tell people before an interview, that's, that's how I am. I just, you know, just talk, feel comfortable. You're not talking too much. Just keep it going. And, uh, if you need, if you need to take a break or whatever, I'll hop right in. I'm good. Uh, and so that's kind of how I do the show. And, uh, it's kind of grown a lot. Uh, I've, I've now started taking that next step into the Joe Rogan environment where I, I'm bringing people into my studio for in-person conversations and um, I can't do everybody. Uh, I'd like to eventually, but right now it's people that can make their way to the studio. I've, I've flown in, I think three or four people since I started doing that. And those were really special occasions kind of thing. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's just that next step for me, I think is just bringing people in studio because the, the energy is different. It, it, and I, I never could have expected how much different, but I remember the first time I sat in studio with somebody to actually do that face to face. I was just like, oh, yeah, this is good. Like, this is really good. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's just been it's been a wild ride, the, the whole transition. And, um, you know, I, I did people ask me, you know, like, did you what, what was your goal? Like, were you planning on doing this for a living? And my answer is 100 percent. Yes. <laughs> like when I started it, I treated it like a business right off the jump. Um, and I could, because I didn't have any kids yet. You know, I, my first year of podcasting, I didn't have any kids. It wasn't until December. I started in January, December, my son was born that whole first year. I just could get the, the gears rolling and really just work it. And I did, I just did that. I mean, up until I, I quit driving truck, I would drive truck 12, 14 hours a day. And then I would come home at night and go in the studio and work on things. And I would go to bed at like two, three o'clock in the morning, get up in the morning, go back to work. And that's just what I did all the time. Uh, and that's what I did from the beginning, you know, before the payoff was kind of, because when I quit driving truck, obviously I was making money doing it. But in the beginning, I, I did the same thing. Um, and so that's just how I did it. I think I was talking to somebody recently and they, we were talking about building podcasts and stuff. And I told them, to be honest with you, I feel like if you start a podcast a day, the formula is completely different than what it was when I started. The competition's greater. There's more people out there. Um, even like the, the quality from a, for, for a new podcast. Like When I started podcasting, it was still common for people to get on their cell phones and record their podcast on their cell phones. Now, if you did that, like that's a that's a death wish. <laughs> like you need to have at least some kind of microphone, or else you're just kind of uh, floating out there. So yeah. And then how do the how do the movies and the later stuff you've been doing recently, like the documentaries, fit into that? Yeah, I it beats me. Like <laughs> I you just started doing those last year or two, or yeah, yeah. So I I started. It just it just happened. It just was a, a, a weird evolution process. Um, I I started Merkel Media when I was driving truck, and I just I thought I had this idea that I was going to start a podcast company where I produce other people's podcasts. Yeah, um, that that's how I started with Macroaggressions with Charlie. Um, my goal was like I I wasn't, and this is something that I always try to stress because every time I say this, especially on somebody else's show, I get emails. I, I could use help starting a podcast. That wasn't what I do. And that's not what I do. Uh, we start podcasts. What, what we were doing is we were starting podcasts for people who already had followings, just not a podcast. Um, because I wasn't interested in building your base. I was interested in helping you enhance your base with uh, the audio side of things. And so um, that's what it was supposed to be. And that's what it was. We had several podcasts on there. Uh, we wound up going, getting down to basically Charlie, uh, another podcast I started with my dad, and then The Confessionals. Um, and 
I had I had a couple other shows on there, but they got can well the one got canceled. Uh I'm not even gonna drop the name because <laughs> it's one of those things. But uh yeah, he he's a good dude. He's a good dude, but you know, anyways. Um so I uh I was planning on just doing that, but the one day I was interviewing this guy, it was episode three thirty-five. And um it was I called it dog versus dog man. And this guy, Kyle, comes on and he shares this wild experience. Uh with he's in Kentucky, he's 15 years old, uh, and he tells the story of how he goes out hunting for raccoons at night with his grandfather. And uh, very long story short, uh, a dog man comes in to this this hunt. Uh, coyotes had come in and they were fighting his dogs, and then a dog man came in. A dog man being like a werewolf creature to anybody who doesn't know, um, and he winds up coming across this creature at the scene of this fight. And uh, it takes chase after him. The only reason why he survives is because his dog interv- intervened, uh, I think, three times. And um, so it was a dramatic story. It was a very good, um, entertaining story. I mean, it was captivating. And I asked him uh, if if I came down there, would he let me would take me to where this happened? Because I was just like, this is just wild. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, you're going to have to bring an army, though. And this is a guy who this happened to him when he was 15. He's mid thirties now, and he won't go in the woods at night. And he's, he said, I'll take you out there, but I'm not going to stay out there at night with you. You're crazy. If you do that, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm yeah. Yeah. In the words, in the, in the words of Alex Jones, you know? So I, uh, decided to go and I, I got a team of guys together and I just got it. I got, I figured let's, uh, let's shoot footage for a week. I'll pay for everybody's trip to come down and uh we'll just make it a youtube video that's what i thought it'd be and um so we go down there me and three other guys and i just i underestimated the quality of of talent that i had uh like joel joel i didn't really know what he his interest was even in these topics and turns out he was very interested in these topics um and then, so he became like, he's, he's like my daredevil. Like if we ever do become like come across a portal, like behind you, like I, I, we will send Joel right through because his kids are grown and he has nothing else to do with himself. So he's just going to go right through for us. Um, but you know, Ward, he's a, he's the cameraman. And, um, I didn't realize how, uh, how good he is. Uh, I, I should have had a clue because he he uh, used to work for Glenn Beck at the Blaze, and you know so that, that obviously he knows what he's doing. But when you're walking through the woods and doing the run and gun thing, like this is not a studio, so so I'm not sure what he's able to do. It turns out um, I think he's actually better at this, and so uh, it was just really it was a good squad of guys. And when we came out with this, we released it on YouTube. Uh, around that time when we released it on YouTube, I had done an interview with a guy named Joseph Granda, and he, he's he got 30 years experience in Hollywood. He's been on Broadway, and he had some wild paranormal experiences happen to him. And so I did that episode with him, which was episode 420, and uh, him and I started talking after that episode and just getting to know each other, becoming friendly. And when we released on YouTube, uh, him and I were kind of talking about films and the possibilities and he goes so you have that thing on youtube right now it's like yeah and he goes how many views does it have and i said almost two hundred thousand in the last two months and he's like you need to take that off youtube right now he's like and i'm, and I'm like why and he's like do you want to make money off this <laughs> i was like yeah and he's like yeah i can help you do that but it's not on youtube and so and he was right. <laughs> so um we 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 barely made any money on YouTube uh and we have made money on our first film but it was through different venues. What what venues was it through? So we went through a distributor and so this distributor shoots it out to it, so wait the way it works at least with this distributor I I I'm I'm learning as I go. So my story for this might change a year from now but uh the distributor we're using uh is a, is a company called Film Hub. And what they do is they take my footage and all the the things that we have to give them, like closed captionings, different um, size artwork and everything. They take that whole bundle and they ship it out to all these different uh, providers like Amazon, Apple, Tubi, all those, uh, like, th- like I think, they, not thousands, I think it's over 100, 100 different um, companies they work with. And 
they basically put it on their front doorstep and that company has to choose to bring on that film. And depending on what kind of uh, deal they work out on, on, like, like Amazon is, you know, pay for the film as you watch things as a customer. So, and then there's like uh, Tubi where you don't pay at all. Uh, it, you just do the, you have to watch the advertising commercials. So um, those, those different platforms, the way they bring on the film is very different. So like Tubi, uh, or not Tubi, I forget which one. Some of them will purchase it right up front and then some others will send ad, ad revenue or you know pay on demand kind of thing revenue. Uh, so when you have access to all those different platforms, um, we definitely made out way better than we would have just keeping it on YouTube. Now, obviously, it being on YouTube and it being free, free to share helps the virality of it and you know people to see it. But it turns out people still see it, you know, uh, doing it the way we're doing it. And um, you know, maybe one day we'll put it on, we'll put things on YouTube when they're older films and we just put it out there. But right now, our model is. Uh, very specific subject to change, but how we release films moving forward, uh, there's basically three stages. Uh, the first stage is doing a live premiere. So people buy tickets to be the first ones in the world to watch it. It's a virtual premiere. And every time we've done one, it's gotten bigger and uh, better. Uh, the next one we're already planning is going to be better because we're not going to use the same service we used last time. Uh, then the next stage is the on-demand stage through Merkle.media, my website. So I have the film, ha the film has a uh, on-demand page through Vimeo that is linked through my website. So people can purchase or rent on-demand. Once the sales drop off from that, then we go to Amazon, Tubi, and Apple and use their, their push. But because I've been around a long time in this industry, um, I'm able to use my platform that I've built over the years to really kind of push the on-demand nature, which is just um, you make more money per purchase than you would through Amazon. Uh, and we're trying to make our investment back at least, you know? So uh, it, it, it just makes sense to do it this way. Um, Amazon, for instance, I think it's somewhere around like the 50% mark they take. So like say it's $10, they take five. Yeah. They take that other five and they send it to my distributing company who takes 20% of the $5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's just like by the time it gets to you, you have like pennies, you know. Yeah. So we, that's that's the last step. But um, yeah, I mean that that's that's our process. And uh, to get back to your <clears throat> your original question, uh, that's how we got into the filmmaking. Uh, and Joseph kind of came in and he just said, "Let's be professional here." And wow. so that was the first film, the second film is The Shape of Shadows. And that was the first one Joseph was a producer for. And it was just like the level of professionalism was stepped up tenfold because like, I, first of all, I didn't know what I was doing for the first one. I just spent thousands of dollars on this trip with a bunch of guys. My wife's like, so you're basically going camping for a week and spending thousands of dollars. I'm just like, probably. Yeah. Yep. That's probably about it. You know? Um, and then with Joseph though, I mean, he arrived a day early before everybody else just to uh, go throughout the area, knock on doors, ask people if they're willing to talk to us and just doing all that legwork uh, that was just so helpful. And so it, it's just been, it's been a, a learning curve uh, and a progression, but I, I personally, I fully expect that Merkle Media uh, 10 years from now is going to be just absolutely huge. I think 10 years from now, we're hopefully going to have kids cartoons and just I'm basically trying to copy the Daily Wire, you know, like I'm just like they're doing a really good thing over there. I like the way they're doing everything. So why not just copy them? So that's what I'm. Yeah, thinking. it's good. To, well, it's good to have that intention, too. And that, uh, you know, you can manifest it if you really believe it's going to happen. So, yeah, well, so I really did. Go ahead. Did you uh, did you see anything on that dog man video or how did that go? Yeah, so I killed a dog, man. No, I wish. Mm. I wish. Uh, I, I, some people get mad when I say that, but I, I mean it. Like, if I had a chance well, to kill it, I would. So. I'm wearing my Save Sasquatch shirts for this episode, so I would take a bullet for Sasquatch. <laughs> okay, take a so. bullet? You'd take a bullet. Well, would you really? me jumping across, Brad, me Brad, jumping across right there. What? It used to be you just wouldn't shoot him. Now you're no, 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 this is me jumping across taking a bullet. Yeah. So would you still feel that way? Well, yeah, you would die for Sasquatch, so, and and it's it's in also to support Ryan, who your film was about the guy that bought the bought the the, the land near 
Skinwalker Ranch because he was making his property like a safe space for mm-hmm. these entities, kind of. Yeah. Know? So I was yeah. like, okay, I want to wear my safe Sasquatch shirt. So when we were texting today to arrange our blue outfits together, uh, yeah. I was look I was looking for my my blue cryptid shirt and I couldn't find it. So I'm glad you found yours. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so that first film, it was a good film for your first film, right? But we didn't catch anything on film, and uh, I know that frustrated people. But the other option is for me to lie to you. And that's like not what I do. So, I mean, you 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 sit here and you're trying to think how are we going to make a good film, right? And the idea of you know what what line can we push without going too far comes up, and it's like I'm the absolute gauge on that. I'm like, guys, I built my entire reputation yeah. on featuring people's real stories. If exactly. I come out with films that are fake, it's going to ruin everything I've built. So. Yeah. I'd rather have a boring film and true than a, a film that gets exposed five years later as a fake film. Uh, and so we decided to just be honest and that's, that's the way we do it. So Expedition Dogman, we spent a week in the, the Daniel Boone National Forest. Uh, we found a very large canine print, probably about, about that size. It was large. Uh, we had you know what we believe a tree pushed down when we were going through the woods. Uh, the main thing that happened on that film is something that I didn't experience myself. So we said when we set off into the woods, you know, it's our first film. We don't know what's going on. We said we stay together. We don't split up. That's it. Like we're not splitting up. And what happens? We split up. And <laughs> I, I, it, it, I, I found out that it's good to have a game plan, but we rarely stick to it. And uh, we've done three. We're about to do our fourth film in two weeks from now. We're going out to do another film. Uh, and we, we're getting better, but we just never stick to the game plan. So it's just loose. But um, we, we hit this spot in this trail where uh, Kyle, the guy who was showing us around, uh, said that he believed there was a watering hole up a hill where the government put in for the game to be able to drink without going to the lake where people would be able to hunt them this easily. And so we start walking our way up there and we're about 20, 30 feet up the hill. And all of a sudden, uh, everybody, the three guys that we left on the trail, they're like, get down here, get back here. I'm just like, what the heck? We go down there and we get the story of Joel was coming around this turn on a trail and right in front of him, there was a very large tree, very, very large. Uh, and he said it just shook back and forth like something was just grabbing it and shaking it. And uh, he sees it and he quick turns around to look at Christian behind him. And when when he tells he says, Christian, did you see that? Christian looks up and it does it again. And Christian sees it. And that's when they call me over. So like we co- I come down there. I don't see anything. And I, t- I asked them, I said, did you see anything? They said, no. Did you see anything like run through that it left? And they said, no, it, nothing. We, we, so I, it's like, theoretically, it's still here. And uh, that's what comes into the interdimensional aspect of these things. And the, the people talk about, and I, you know, I, I kind of, not even kind of, I, I definitely buy into it. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very woo woo. Um, I think that these things are very physical too, but I just think that when we lock ourselves into one frame of thinking for our own comfort, we lose out on a lot of context. Um, so we we're there and we send again we split up we send Joel and Christian down the trail around the other side of the hill just in case they could push this thing back up towards us and uh so they go off and I forgot to give them the radios that I brought with me and so I'm just like comms are not even a thing we're standing there and and the guy Kyle who's showing us around He's like, do you see that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And there was this twinkling light. And this didn't even make the film. Uh, I don't even know. I, maybe we didn't get it on film, but Ward was there. Uh, there was this twinkling light in the trees. This is broad daylight. And I, I see it and it's like pulsating, but not rhythmically. And so I'm thinking, is there something in the tree that's m- waving in the wind? There wasn't really any wind. So I go over there and I'm right underneath it. And he's like, yes, I see it. I'm looking, I'm like, I don't see it, man. And he's like, it's right there. I'm like, I don't see it. <laughs> and, and so I don't know what that was. Uh, and the only other thing that I, well, there's a couple other things that happened. The The night that we did, uh, the last night, I think it was our last night investigation, uh, we decided to hang um, steaks and lunch meat from trees and really try to bring in something. 
And uh, while Ward and Joel were down hanging stuff, they said right above them, something went through the trees and like all the trees just shook as it went through the trees. And uh, me and Christian didn't hear anything. We didn't see that. We were on night vision. And uh, then the last day there, we were taking down cameras like game trail cams. And uh, Ward had already left. Joel and Christian were about, I don't know, 50, 100 feet away from me. And I was about to take, climb a tree to take down a camera. And I just did a quick scan from left to right to just see, just make sure it doesn't behind me. And uh, as I was coming back around to my right, it was one of those things where you're not expecting to see anything. So like you're just kind of scanning like that. And just as I was coming back around, I swear I saw something walking up the hill that had like a gray conical shape. And this is in the same area of all that activity. The trees shaking and the trees shaking above their heads at night. This is all the same area. Um, there was a down tree going down a hill. And I saw something that was like an ash gray walking up the hill on the other side of the tree. And when I when I jerked my head and looked back, I didn't see anything. And I'm just like, did I really see that, right? But what I can say is uh, Joel went over and looked in that area. And when he walked behind that tree, you couldn't really even see him. Like he just kind of disappeared behind the tree. So whatever it was, was very large or my imagination. So it is what <laughs> it is. So, <laughs> but yeah, that was the first film, which was... It was it was it was quite the journey, but it was a bonding experience, and that kind of just set the precedent moving forward with all these. Right, other and then and then Skinwalker next, right? I mean that 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 I mean that's something we haven't really got too deep into as a as a separate topic here. I mean we've touched on it a few times, but but I love the way you know I listened to that episode where the the owner of the property near Skinwalker you know had, had your podcast, and then you end up going out and doing one of your films right on on his property. Weren't and, we almost there, Grant? Uh, well, it is in Utah, right? It's in, uh, yeah. Like we on were, our way home from Arizona that time, we yeah. thought we were kind of close to it. Yeah, I think I think it's north of uh, that UFO coffee shop thing. Do you know that UFO coffee shop thing at all? It's probably like 100 miles north of that. But they With even the think. Coffee shop, there's that, we, it's that, you're talking about that weird trailer place, right? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Indian, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the road in the creepiest spot. It's right like north of Moab, like uh, probably uh, 50 miles, maybe north of Moab, maybe. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about all the uh, geographical towns and stuff. I know it's in the Uinta Basin. I know when I was looking at the map a lot doing that film, Moab came up a lot. So it's probably right in that area. And and the people in that UFO shop, which is interesting because it's right south of that. I mean, they were saying that in that sort of the back area, there's like activity in there. And then when I was trying to find Skinwalker, I thought it's got to be a little bit north of that. So yeah, it, it, I, it, it's a wild property. Uh, but it's it, I should say this: it's a wild area. Okay, uh, we we went out there, and our whole thing was to get the native perspective and have them just tell the world. That no. basically what? Uh, no, I was just gonna say. I mean, I that I was gonna transition because you talked about the the world views and like keeping your mind open, right? And I was gonna say, yeah. especially if you're stuck in this materialistic scientific world, right? So yeah. that's what I love about the way you guys went into that. Is you went into that without forget like EMF readers and trying to get all this scientific evidence. Like talk to the natives, see what what the like the legends are like, and I really feel like that was the way to go. And that's like, when you hear from like five, you've had like how many guests, like hundreds and hundreds of guests, right. Telling their story. And that's one thing that got us interested is like, forget the evidence. Like there's tons of, there's an, there's a, a plethora of anecdotal evidence that can't be ignored. Right. When there's that much just sort of anecdotal evidence, that's what I, I like. I, I, I I'd rather get into like people's stories than, yeah. than having to prove something is real. Like you're not gonna prove anything's real. That's the, like it, that's the thing. Like there's so much ego with this stuff. I mean, the reality is, I mean, most of the people who get upset about this stuff and take it so personal, they have this very uh, flawed view of themselves that they 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 hold this important role and they're going to be the ones to do it, and that's why they take it too so serious. And in my view, in my view, too serious. Uh, and so for us, we're just like. We're not trying to prove anything. And that's kind of like basically probably why, why we do it is because that's how I do my show. Like I'm, I don't bring people on my show to prove anything. I tell my audience, hey, you just heard their story. It's up to you to believe it. It's up to you to decide what you want to believe. What's your threshold of belief? 
You know, like people come into these experiences, and I always use this example because I think it's very accurate. If you took an atheist and a priest, put them in the same room, they had a paranormal experience together, they would describe it very differently. And then when they describe it very differently, half an audience is going to uh, lean towards one person versus the other. They both had the same experience, but it's the way they tell the story. And yep. so um, th with that in mind, it's just like, we're not setting out to prove to the world anything. Like if we get to kill and put a bullet in a dog man's head, sure, that's cool. But like, let's 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 make this process a little bit more of showing the world that people are experiencing things and less of, hey, let me bring out this device and try proving that, you know, something can talk to me through a box. You know, like it's just it, 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 that, it, that kind of stuff, I think, has been beat to death a lot. Um, this next film, we're talking about bringing this one device out, but it, it, we're doing different experiments this time around where we, before we. Because our general idea is to exist in an environment and see, let it unfold around us. Like most people who have paranormal experiences weren't asking for it; it just happened to them. So why not go to the, these areas where this stuff is happening a lot? Exist in those environments for an extended period of time, you know, say a week, where what our job there is to experience and not be distracted by our kids and all that stuff. Uh, and see what happens, you know. And I think that so far we've had uh, a lot of things happen. To be honest with you. Uh, and so it's a good method to kind of work with, but we're, we're going to mess around with some technology in this next one. Uh, I I'll, I'll just say, um, we got a guy who thinks he can open a portal and he, he invented a, a device to do it. And I'm just like, bro, let's okay. just, let's, we got to try, we got to try. <laughs> like, like, I'm just like, you know, like, he's like, I really think it could work. And he's like, it's at least going to change the environment around us to the point you're going to feel it. I'm like, where's yeah. it going to go? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't even know if he's actually fully tested it yet. So I'm just like, it, it, he's like, this is real Nikola Tesla stuff, man. I'm just like, it better be because if you show up with like a, a piece of plastic from Radio Shack, I'm going to be pissed. Like, it better look rope around. What is it? Jo Who's the adventure guy? Uh, Who's your daredevil? Hook a rope around him and send him in. And then, <laughs> oh, yeah, Joel. Yeah, yeah. You know he's pushing back if she gets weird. I mean, we were going to send ground to Mars, but then he chickened out. Like, no, no, no! I did. I I didn't make it through the first cut. I mean, so would, did you go through the portal too? Then you could go with Joel. Well, that's what I was thinking, but now life's changed, and you know, I probably wouldn't do it this time. Yeah, I got, yeah. <laughs> that's I a lot. single single part of my life when I was willing to like leave the planet. If yeah. it's really like, <laughs> you a fake it's Mars, a fake guy on Mars, portal, Mars I mean, to go back to the dating scene. <laughs> yeah, like I. So I, <laughs> I uh. I, when I when I was before I had kids before I was podcasting I would go hiking and looking for Bigfoot you know like I and not like looking just hiking and seeing what yeah. happens and I was yeah. always like if I ever came across a Bigfoot I'm pretty sure I would run towards it because back then I was like I was kind of suicidal about it. I was like I'd rather die by the hands of a Bigfoot than not know if it really exists and Did then I had my, yeah for sure yeah. I would yeah yeah, <sighs> yeah. I, I I I I'm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm in you now. I mean, you're ruining my image of you. <laughs> but I, if I'd have known we we're going to talk about all this, I would have worn. I mean, my shirt's dirty because I wore it the other day. But I have the opposite shirt of his. It's just, it's just Bigfoot, and it says With a big target. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a sh advocate of shooting the beast. So here's the thing. I'm an advocate of it, but in the moment, I will see. You know, like that's the thing. I mean, I, I hear that it looks very human. Also, if it's a terrifying yeah, situation, like like what if it's this hulking thing? It's a terrifying situation, and all of a sudden the thought goes through your head: What if the shot doesn't take it down? And I really tick this thing off, you know, like all that you stuff. Gotta go. Where are you going to shoot it? Head or neck? I or think that head. I've heard your head. Yeah, yeah head, head your face. Yeah, I would like to. I mean, center mass. My head idea is this, though, like. They have, I, I hear about people shooting these things, and especially in the chest, and not, it doesn't do anything. And I've heard this theory that the bone structure is extremely thick. And so bullets don't typically penetrate it. So I wonder sometimes, is the head like that too? But the neck, that's nice and soft. So you can let that thing bleed out a little bit. Uh, totally. that's yeah. What face, though, there's like a bunch of holes in there already, right? <laughs> yeah. But like a nice 300 wind mag in his face. Damn, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> Graham looks like he's so disappointed right now. <laughs>
I can't believe it. I mean, you guys can try all you want. That's what I say. Like, you're never going to do it because he's just going to, like, you're going to either look into his eyes and not be able to do it, or you're going to try and he'll just skitter out of it, out of this dimension into another dimension. I, I fully expect that. I fully expect that. If I ever even see one, I fully expect that something's going to happen to prevent me from pulling. Is it just because it's a Bigfoot or is it because it's too human looking? Because, I mean, humans are real good at shooting each other, man. It doesn't even phase us. <laughs> That's true. That's it true. It doesn't even fucking phase us. When our blood's up, fucking look out. Well, the other thing is, too, there's this this unreasonable fear that happens in a lot of these things, too, right? I mean, yeah. you never know how you'll just get just locked up with this weird fear. Yeah. And that's, a, and that's what I think could very well happen to me. I've never been in, in any kind of situation like that. You say humans shoot each other. I'm like, well, I haven't shot anybody yet. And so... I haven't been in that situation. It's all theory at this point. But uh, I, I do think that there's the possibility of locking up. There's, I think that there's the possibility of something else happening that prevents me from doing it. Like uh, my brother and I were in Pennsylvania and we went into, um, what was it called? Michaux State Forest. And so this, this forest, it's known for its Bigfoot, dogman activity, sightings. It's a haunted forest. It has everything going for it. Uh, but we went out there for that stuff but we went to a specific location because we knew we could find that and at least make a youtube video out of it and it turns out uh almost every single state in the united states during world war ii had inter or not interrogation camps uh con or not concentration camps either internment, internment camps thank you <laughs> we're gonna get there uh but not all the camps were interrogation camps uh but the one in pennsylvania was so they were actually bringing nazis in and interrogating them and i was looking i was like okay so you know we killed nazis it's haunted but the thing is i couldn't find anywhere online that said that yeah we were we we killed nazis in these camps everything i was well, I reading would have been mostly japanese right well i i think it was probably both but i know that the one in pennsylvania that i was looking at definitely housed the nazis uh, because there, I forget what art, I don't know where the article was. I just remember reading about it because I was getting depressed because I was like, I'm trying to do this video, but I, I, I need some kind of angle of it, this, this camp being haunted. And then I read that, uh, the Nazis actually, after being interrogated, if they go back to their ho holding facility where they're all together, um, if they felt like one of the people were too forthcoming with information, they killed that person. I was like, that's my angle. So I go out there. And we spend a night out in those woods investigating the ruins and stuff because there's all these down buildings and stuff. Um, and while we were out there, I, for the first time in my life, heard a Bigfoot howl. And I, I, I wasn't expecting it. And what really kind of pushing this idea of weird things happening when you encounter this stuff that you just have no control over, um, we had two cameras. And my brother had a night vision camera. And so we get to this spot. We're out. I don't even know where we're at. Like we're just, we're just walking in the middle of the forest. And I turn off my camera and I turn off my light and I pull out a K2 meter. And I'm like, we're here for a haunted forest kind of thing. So let's see if we get any kind of spikes on this, right? My brother has the night vision camera rolling. And so he's standing maybe 10 feet away from me. And I hold this thing out and it starts spiking out in the middle of the forest. And I was like, wow, okay. So I look at my brother and I'm like, okay, cool. And so I hold it out again. And all of a sudden we hear this, ah, like real long, loud howl. And then it drops off and it sounded like something responded to it with a weaker howl. And um, my eyes got real big. I look at my brother. I'm like, do you think you with that, that got caught on audio? And he's like, absolutely. I was like, yes. Like, I was like, this is amazing. We get back to my truck. And I review the footage, no audio. Wow. And I know what happened. And here's the thing. So people say weird things happen to electronics with Bigfoot and stuff. This, in this case, it was our fault because we, earlier in the night, it started downpouring. So we went back to the truck. And when it, when it laid off, we, w we went back out for a second round. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. And Jack takes his camera and sets it on the hood of my truck. And when I closed the door, it fell off and the cable for the microphone snapped and we didn't know it. And so it's dark out and I turn on the, I'm pissed. Like I'm like the camera broke, right? The camera didn't break. And so I see it's working. I'm like, oh good. Thank God, dude, you're lucky. I'd kill you, you know? 
And so we didn't know the cable for the camp that the microphone snapped. And so we didn't catch it. It was just a, it was just a, uh, an electronic hum the entire like two or three hours we were out there. And so, uh, you know, weird things do happen when you, when you do the Bigfoot stuff and all this cryptid stuff just malfunctions, whether it's, it's, you know, my own error or whatever. But, um, yeah, anyways, I, I, I don't know how we got on this topic, but yeah, I think my goal is to, if I can encounter and I can get a clean shot to take it, but we'll see what happens in the moment. I might get scared. I probably will get scared. So. Well, especially after being in, in, uh, in near Skinwalker there and having that, that sort of stuff happen to you and hearing the, and hearing the details of the, the natives in the area and, the, and some of the locals and some of the sort of lycanthropic uh, sightings. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And and so that you know that you believe the stuff is is legit, at least some of it. And mm-hmm. and you, yet you're still wanting to go out there. Like, don't you ever wonder if you should just leave it alone? Like, do you ever think that maybe you shouldn't play around with this stuff? Or uh, typically, I think yeah, probably uh, in a normal frame of mind. But your curiosity uh, is just too much to. Well, I, yeah, curiosity. There's also the fact that I don't think it's as easy as. I, I wish it was to to uncover this stuff, you know. And so, what are the odds I'm actually going to see a dog, man? You know. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. But also, uh, I think there's because, I, like I said, I'm real woo woo with it, which is also why I think if I shoot at it, the bolts are just going to go right through or something. Um, I I think there's a real spiritual nature to this stuff, and I I just me and my entire team uh, feel like it's almost like our mission in life to show the world. Uh, that the supernatural realm is is real and exists. Um, we're all Christians, and you know I t- I talk about that stuff all the time. And with that, we kind of look at the Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible, and how supernatural those stories are. And we just kind of look at what's happening in the world around us, and these stories that are coming to my show and stuff. And we're just like, there's a connection here, you know. And so it, it it's um I don't know I don't I don't know how to describe it. Like it, it's just like this gut calling that we all feel like we're just like this is what we're supposed to do and uh we're all in agreement on it so yeah I, in normal situations i think that we would be kind of uh hey this is probably a dumb idea but we just kind of we're, we're, we're just crazy i guess the bottom line is we're, no, we're no, I, I mean i appreciate that I, and i i kind of i can see that for sure plus you have guns yeah well the the, 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 listen, the, the Shape of Shadows film, we didn't have guns. We weren't allowed because Ryan doesn't allow guns on the property. So, Not even like a side piece? Not even no. Like a side no. Piece. I don't no. <laughs> so, uh, the best we could do was like a hatchet or something, you know? Oh. Uh, so, Ryan, Ryan, the story with Ryan is he was in Utah. He doesn't live in Utah, but he was in Utah probably for business or something. And he's driving in the Skinwalker Ranch area. He didn't know about Skinwalker Ranch. And he sees an elderly person walking down the road. He pulls over to see if they need help. And when he pulls over, he says, Hey, you need help. They get in the truck. Don't really even say anything to him. And the next thing he knows, he's down the road, hanging out of his truck, catatonic, and he's just out of it. And the person's gone and he calls the police and the police are like the the reservation police. And they come out and they tell him that you were nabbed by a skinwalker. And he's like, this is new. What are we talking about here? That set him down this, this path of, discovery and somehow he convinced his wife to allow him to buy property in utah for research <laughs> and so that's what he did he found a uh, property that budded skinwalker ranch like it, it, they literally share a fence line and um he decided he was going to call the property space wolf research for the sheer number of ufos and dogmen that are seen in the area and um so he calls it Space Wolf Research and he starts doing this research stuff. And originally he didn't have problems with guns, guns on the property. Uh, but he realized that he wanted to create this property as like a safe haven for these things. And so he didn't want any of this stuff to feel like, hey, don't go over there. They got a gun and they always shoot at us kind of thing. Uh, so he had he had caretaker. Uh, I think it was his first caretaker on the property had um, a visitor over at the the house one night. And uh, they hear something outside. They go outside. And I, I, I feel like I tell this story wrong, but it's been a long time since I heard it. I think it was like three uh, dogmen, like upright standing canines on one side of a fence. And when they come out, these things step over the fence line towards them. And they unleashed bullets on them. And it did nothing. And so uh, 
at that point he loses a caretaker for the property they and then that started the revolving door he even the caretaker that was out there last year isn't there anymore so the one i met he's gone oh, so really? there you go Graham. The movie you could be oh. a skinwalker ranch caretaker yeah yeah <laughs> I, I i could tell you um Ryan would welcome you doing work on the house to renovate it a little bit. But <laughs> in fact, if you did that, he'd probably say you can live there for free because he does that anyways. It's your job. That's the cool thing is like uh, the, the caretaker lives there for free and it's their job to work that property. And so that's all they do. And they experience weird things because they're there so much. Uh, I, th I think it was the caretaker that we met uh, he said that at one point, one night he was in the house and he sees this girl coming up out of the floor, this little girl. And that's like, you know, real horror movie stuff. I, I think I'd rather see a dog man than see that. Uh, but yeah, the property is crazy. And we, 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 before we even got out there, there was activity going on. Uh, Ryan called me a week before I left and said that he had like a 40 foot container on the property and it just lifted up and moved like probably about 15 20 feet and rotated 90 degrees uh and we that we feature that in the film uh, and what's really interesting about it is uh joseph being a good producer he actually called around to different heavy machinery operators and uh was asking who if anybody came out to do this and they said they hadn't rent rented any equipment out uh and also on that note, like it's very hard to get a tractor trailer into that property. And, you know, I can actually, one of the very few things I can speak intelligently on backing a tractor trailer up into that property would be very hard. Okay. So, uh, I just take my word for it. Uh, the caretaker would have heard it for sure. Uh, and what's also well, interesting would have scraped a little bit too, right? I mean, when you pick those up, I think you have to scrape them a bit, right? Yeah. And there, there was no, there was, only like four or five scrape marks at all and it was on top of these bigger rocks so there was no drag marks on the ground and so that tells you it was elevated immediately and it wasn't elevated very high because there underneath this container there was tons of rocks and there were some bigger rocks that kind of sat down in the ground from the pressure of the container but they sat up about four or five inches and just the top of them were scratched like the container just caught it, but not enough to make it move out of the divot that was created. And so, uh, I don't know, but we actually ran into a guy that has been doing research in that area. Uh, his name is James Keenan. And he was in the documentary. He was talking about how there's magnetic anomalies in that whole area. And he believes that that's how that container was moved, that there was some kind of burst of energy that pushed it up and, and kind of shifted it. Um, he said a lot of things that I just kind of stood there and be like, mm, yes, that was the anthropologist, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't even know what he was. I, I was just like, I was, I was really trying to gather what he was saying and whatever I couldn't gather. I was just like, act like you understand, totally understand you're being filmed right now. One shot. You have one shot at this. <laughs> and so I was just, uh, trying to really look like I was on top of it. Um, I had no idea what he was talking about, though. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was uh, one of those things where later on I saw him featured on the Skinwalker Ranch show. And so um, he talked on that show about the magnetic anomalies and how there's this line, this like straight line of magnetic anomalies going through Skinwalker Ranch. And uh, I had talked to James after that aired. I think I was texting him or something. And he said to me that that straight line goes right into Ryan's property where that container was. And uh, along that entire line, there's weird things that are happening. So uh, with that area, I, I just keep telling people like there's, there's things going above your heads. There's things going on on the ground and then below the ground. This is like an area that just has so much going on. Um, it, it's like you just take your pick. I mean, cryptids, skinwalkers, UFOs, portals, portals, Yes, portals. Uh, Ryan has uh, caught a portal on his uh, security camera and uh, just a lot of weird things. We, we got a ritual circle out there, uh, which was wild, uh, not expected at all. And I feel like when we discovered that ritual circle, that kind of kicked the night off. So it, I know this, this is going to sound crazy. I know it's going to sound crazy, but like 
I really feel like the area was aware we were there. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I don't right know. Away when you guys got there, it was, it was off, right? Lights yeah. and, sky and all kinds of stuff. I mean, like, so there was like a welcoming party before I even got there. Joseph and Christian got a UFO on film in broad daylight. And when we found that, then we get out there the next day and we explored the whole area, which is where we found the, the, the trackway where the going from human to horse. Uh, actually, let me tell you that real quick. That that is, so I had, or or I, wolf, or human to to. Oh yeah, it was horse, right? Yeah, it was yeah. Horse, it was, right? We found yeah. a canine print there too, but it was mainly horse and human. Um, it was only one canine print, which was interesting too. I think it was only one. Um, but I when when we found that, I was like thinking, okay, logically, you know, like how how is this explained? Uh, you, cause these tracks were very deep into the ground. It must've been highly saturated at some point and then dried up and uh, we had these great prints, which by the way, um, every time I look back at that footage, I want to punch myself in the face for stepping in the tracks. Like, I, like, I, like, that's the thing. Like you have a game plan going out and then you get there and everything just, it's gone. Like I, all the, all the theory you have, all the strategy is like, if I was there, I'd do this. Yeah. Okay. When you're there, it's all different. And so, um, they, they, that, and that's actually in the film. And I was hoping that they wouldn't put it in the film, but they did. And I was like, well, I'm not going to complain about it. It is what it is. Uh, but I, these trackways go down a hill and it's just human tracks. And then immediately the tracks are gone and then replaced is these hooves, like horse hooves. And I was thinking like, okay, so what happened here is somebody was with a horse and they were walking down the hill. Then they got on their horse and they walked away on the horse and that's why that transition happened and then i was just like oh i can't I, I can't get around the idea that we don't have horse prints up where the human prints are and we're out here hunting skinwalkers and i was like and this is the first day and i'm like this it can't be this easy right like this is like i'm not supposed to find anything you know <laughs> like, exactly, exactly. Like, like when i go out to these places like i'm not expecting to have anything happen like the odds are not in my favor Especially when shapeshifters, shapeshifters is the main, one of the main themes, you know, mm -hmm. shapeshifters of all kinds. I mean, it's not just like, you know, werewolf type things, but it's horses, birds, wolves, and, yeah. and to see something that actually might, you know, signify a shapeshifter. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I, it was, it was nuts. Um, but the natives that came out verified it to us that they, uh, separately, they verified it that in their opinion, that was a skinwalker, a shapeshifter. And so um, that was the first day. And so when we, that night came and we're all hanging around the fire and all of a sudden, again, methodology, working out the chemistry, I, uh, I'm sitting at the fire and I just remember, I'm like, oh, I got these game trail cams. We should set these up. You should have set it up during the day. But uh, I, I was like, well, we can do it tomorrow. But then you're like, well, you're wasting a whole, a whole night and you just, you just never know. And so. Um, Ward, my cameraman, is also probably the most security conscious person on the team. And so I brought him with me down there just, just to hang up cameras. And his camera, we didn't bring because it's not a, a night vision camera. You, you, it's really not great in low light. So um, he just comes down with me and we walk all the way down, down these trails up to where we found that trackway and figured this is probably a good area to put the cameras, cameras up. So I see this like dead tree across a creek. And so we cross the creek and I put a, I go to put this game trail cam on the creek facing the trail where those tracks are. I'm thinking maybe we catch somebody transforming or whatever, even just a person walking, they shouldn't be back there. Um, and so I'm standing at the tree, getting ready to climb the tree and, and put the camera up again. And again, just like in the first film, I scan from left to right to look behind me just to make sure Ward's there watching my back. We're out here hunting monsters. And uh, I turn around fully expecting Ward to be standing right behind me. And he's not. He's like 20 feet away from me. And not only is he 20 feet away from me, his back is towards me, not even looking at me. His head is completely down at his feet and his hands are in his hoodie pockets. And he's just standing there still. And I'm like, oh, no, Ward's possessed. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, this is not good. And uh, I'm like, and I look down at his feet. And I see a skull. It's dark out. And I can only see one skull. It's like a cow skull. And I, I just said, is that what I think it is? And he goes, yeah. 
And so I was like, oh, okay. So I'm thinking we're just going to carry this, this cow skull up and you know, scare the guys with it and just goof around. Um, and so I hang the camera. I walk over to, to Ward and it wasn't just a skull. It was multiple bones, multiple skulls. It was a circle. They had offerings in the middle. And I was like, holy crap. So he gets his phone out and he takes pictures of it. And uh, we go back up to the campsite. And when we're talking to the guys and showing them what we found, you know, everybody's getting creeped out about it. And then all of a sudden, there's a light that shoots up in the sky across the valley on the Mesa. And um, that, like, that's what I mean. Like, I feel like the area was aware we were there and decided to give us a show our first day. Um, this light, it, it had to be two, three miles away. I mean, it was far away. But from our distance, it was very wide. It was a very wide source of light. And I, I always say it had to be at least 50 to 100 feet wide, whatever this was, giving off this light up into the sky. And so I, um, we, get, we get up and we start seeing this light and we're looking at it. And I get a, I think it was me or my brother, got our Sony A7 out, which is really good with low light pictures. And uh, we took some pictures of it and that's in the film. Uh, side note of that, I actually, sound, I actually saw this, the same phenomenon on the Skinwalker Ranch show not too long ago. And so I don't know if they documented the same night or if this is a repeating thing that happens out there. But it, it was really nice, actually, to see them documenting that as well. Uh, but as we're looking at that light and kind of just amazed by it, that's when the sky just lit up. It, it like I think it had to be at least two hours. Just UFOs all over the place, going up and down, side to side, changing lights. Um, it, it was just it was a wild experience, and Joel was just like beside himself. He was. <laughs> <laughs> like, like joel was like like i just know joel's gonna go through a portal one day like that's just gonna happen like he was like he he did everything but come short of just putting his arms out saying take me like that lady in uh independence day you know like he just he it was just like take me that's the kind of attitude he had um and, and that was the that was what we were kind of going through that first night and it was just it was it was really wild um and that kind of I, I that that the reason why I kind of feel like the area was aware, and I don't know if that's like a paranormal aware or or maybe people knew we were there and they were setting off their UFO devices. I don't know. Uh is because we had so much activity the first day. And then the next couple of days we spent unpacking that first day's activity we we totally felt like we were going to like we were basically going to solve the mystery capture a dog man surf a ufo all of it like we were like this is going to be legit cuz the first day you have all this stuff and it's like wow um and then the rest of the days we spent just kind of unpacking that and uh then we went through a car a car chase which was pretty wild our wives did not yeah care. did not like you going after the car no no so how did you ever figure out who they were at all or no no uh i don't know who it was i because here's the thing so i get the sense that not all natives like the idea that people like me go out there um and we were trying to be re respectful as respectful as we can i mean i'm, I'm sure just the idea of documenting the, the this stuff is disrespectful to a certain degree um but you know we were trying to get the native perspective and, and show the people that this is not a ranch thing, but this is an area thing. This happens all over the area. And um, so we weren't sure if this was people that maybe were from the reservation that just were not thrilled with us being there. Or maybe, I don't think it was this, but I'll just put it out there just just so that people don't think I'm overlooking it. Could it be the people from Skinwalker Ranch? I don't know. Um, I don't think it was them, to be honest with you. They don't strike me as those kind of guys that really care that much. Uh, they got their own thing going on. Um, but could it be like Men in Black, a, an agency? I don't know. But uh, what happened was we went out to like Walmart or something, and we were coming back. And it was just me, Joel, Ward, Christian, and my brother. Uh, we left Joseph at camp that night and we're coming down this road 
and we turn into the property, go past the caretaker's house. And once I got past the caretaker's house, Joel goes in, in the Joel way. So like Joel and me are like, Joel can get energetic, but he also has a real chill mode. And I'm very like, when, when anything's off, I get very energetic instantaneously. Uh, but Joel, he is the one that knows something is off. And he just goes, uh, Hey Tony, can can you stop the car for a second? I'm like, sure. You know, so I stopped the car and he gets out and he stands facing the road that we just turned in off of. And he has his hand on his hip, almost like a dad would like, what are you doing? You know? And, um, he just stands there and I don't know if he's peeing on my tire or what he's doing. He gets back in the forerunner and I'm like, Hey, what's up? And he goes, uh, in, in this calm way, he's like, yeah, uh, we were, we were driving down the road and I saw a car pull out behind us and they didn't have their lights on. And then they turned their lights on and they followed us. And when we turned into the property, they stopped at the driveway and just sat there idling. And I was like, bro, you could have spoke up anytime, like anytime, you know, <laughs> like, like when you realize something's off, say something, you know, you see something, say something. Uh, and so I was like, well, let's go. And so I just, we just, I don't know if there was a group vote, if I just did it or, or what, but right away, because he said when he got out of the car, this vehicle just took off and, um, we turned the car around and we left and we took off after that car. And I'm like, what do we get? What's our plan here, guys? Like, we don't have guns. What if, what if we catch them? What are we going to do? Hey, who are you? Why are you following us? Like, like, what's the plan here? We have no plan at all and uh we're trying to keep up with this vehicle now uh you guys sounds like you guys have been out there at least in the area so like this desert like there's a lot of dirt roads uh a lot of uh heavily traveled roads that are dirt roads you wouldn't think that were heavily traveled and uh this whoever's driving is familiar with the area and they're just gunning it like we i think i got my forerunner up to about 70 miles an hour at one point and this guy just i couldn't keep up with him he had to be going yeah, i do 90 on the dirt roads all the time around here. really Oh yeah, eighty miles or? Oh yeah, 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 like one hundred twenty, one hundred thirty k. Like my heart skips a beat just hearing that. I, I just, I don't, I couldn't go to four wheel drive just so it doesn't skip out on you. Oh my gosh, no, not me. But I, I so I couldn't keep up with them, and I had five guys in the car. Uh, it was dark too. You said, didn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, that's way dark. different. Like during the day here, and probably there too, you can see for ten miles. You know, it's like just a straight shot. Yeah. So um, I see the car turn off onto a major road. You see traffic going back and forth and we get up there and in the process of chasing this guy, we had two other vehicles come up behind us and they were, they were tailing us and um, hearing what Darren's saying, maybe they were just driving normal speed out there. <laughs> There's like, Oh, it's a nice little midnight drive. Um when we got up to the stop sign for that major road, the guy was already gone that was following us initially. Uh, one of the two vehicles behind us had turned off and the other vehicle went around us at the stop sign. And that's when we saw it was like a side by side. It wasn't even really um, a car. And we turn around and we start going back to the camp. And that's when we get a phone call from Joseph. Who's he goes, where are you guys at? We said, you know, we came back, but then we turned around. He told and he's like, Yeah, I saw you guys come in and leave. He said, after you guys left, another car came down the road, turned into the property, went past the caretaker's house, and started coming down the hill towards our camp. And then I flashed my flashlight at them and they stopped immediately, turned around and left. And so there's no way that that original car knew that we would turn around and follow. So my best guess is that when that happened, he got he called somebody else to come into the camp thinking that the camp's empty. And uh, I don't know what the plan was. Is it to destroy the camp, to steal our computers, just to find out what we're doing? I don't know. Uh, but thank God Joseph was there. And uh, he, he stopped that because uh, that could have really ruined our night if somebody stole all our, our footage and our, our hard drives and all that stuff. Uh, but when we got back, somebody thought they saw somebody run down the hillside into a tree line. And that just kind of ruined our last night. We were just on edge. We weren't looking in the skies. We weren't looking for footprints or anything like that. We were just like, who is it in the woods? Why are they here? You know, what are they playing? What's like, like for angry Indians. 
Yeah, right. Some like I wasn't sure what to what to expect, so we just kind of let the investigation die, and uh, that was that was our last night. But it, it was it was a wild journey. It really was, and we had people that came out and told us that you know what they experienced in the area. Like this one couple that lived across the street. Uh, I think a week before we arrived, said they saw one of those upright walking dogs going through the property. So like, and they're like, yeah, this happens all the time out here. And I'm just like, dang, you know, like I, but I, I couldn't have, I, I didn't really understand it then, but I kind of do in a sense now, because when I went out there, I was, I had just moved to Tennessee and I was living in Tennessee for maybe two, three months. And I was still getting used to the culture in this area here, but living here now for going on a year and a half, almost two years, uh, the culture here is very similar in that sense where people experience things here and it's just like, it's, it's just what happens. Like I cannot tell you how many people have Bigfoot encounters here, dogman encounters here. Uh, the Smoky mountains is a very magical place. Uh, missing people, 411 kind of stuff happening. And so when it happens so much, I can see how you can have that nonchalant attitude of just, yeah, it happens. It is what it is. It's like, I'm still breathing. So I'm good, you know? Wow. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> that that place is Darren. It's about a hundred kilometers, hundred kilometers directly north of that little stop that we stop at. And it's like a beef jerky oh, stop. We weren't right? even close. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty close. I mean, when you look at the map, it looks it's wow. pretty straight, straight up there. So, like you said, it's that area. I mean, who knows how far down south it is? But they definitely said they have activity north of where they are, like just north. So maybe it does stretch all the way down there. I, I don't see why it wouldn't. I mean. Yeah. Like this phenomenon, it, it spreads out all over the place, and there's there's hot beds and hot zones all over the country, all over yeah. the world, uh, yeah. and so th there's so many theories that go into that. But there is definitely areas that are particular to have a lot of activity with this stuff, and um, we're just trying to expose it one film at a time. Has, uh, your, has your has your view changed over the years? Like after talking to so many people, and and especially yeah. now that. You've also, you also might, you know, realize that the, the governments are somewhat involved. I mean, there's the whole Bigelow thing and the, some yeah. of the funding and, and the research into portals even and stuff like that. I mean, how, what's your, what's your feeling? What's your, what's your overall sort of thought now on, on all this phenomena? So if I could go back in time to 2017, the, the day that I released my first episode and I said, Hey, Tone, uh, this is, this is where this is all going. I would look at myself and like, what? happened to you you know like, because when i started the podcast i was still pretty much into this idea that i was just transitioning away from bigfoot can only be a physical creature that we can't keep up with i was i was starting to toy with this idea of nephilim that i thought was original and turned out it, it wasn't um and uh and that takes you down this whole supernatural route my views have changed so much and it's because of the people I talk to. So, you know, you can say, oh, well, you know, that person could be lying or crazy. But when you talk to so many people, you get so many emails that don't even make it into the show, but you have their experiences sitting there. It's like you have to kind of readjust thinking and understanding. Um, and I don't even think I gave thought to portals before the show i i it wasn't even on my radar and now it like comes up so much because i'm like portals are real this stuff like it, the interdimensional aspect of this is it's so real i can taste it you know uh and and though i don't ever think i'm gonna see a bigfoot or a dog man i'm out there looking for it but uh i don't think it's easy uh if we can get this guy making a portal machine maybe uh, but time will tell, but yeah, my, my perspectives just, uh, evolved a lot. And so I went from a physical kind of guy to, you know, woo woo interdimensional. Um, and then there's, so there's like, um, basically in my head and maybe even a fourth one, but in my head, there's, there's three camps that I all give credence to. There's the interdimensional aspect, the woo woo angle of it. There's the, uh, physical aspect actually. Yeah. So there's the physical four. There's the physical aspect of this is just a creature we can't keep up with. Okay, I don't really believe that a whole lot, but okay, maybe. Um, 
there's the physical aspect of is this some kind of remnant of some kind of uh, ancient alchemy that 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 you know fallen angels not only having sex with women but also beasts uh, and their offspring i don't know uh but then there's the uh the government angle and that i definitely 100 percent they're dabbling in this stuff um so we we see uh, forget the people that i've talked to about this stuff that that and present pretty convincing arguments or experiences that point to government involvement. Like we see these, these uh, email drops that, that, that happened with Hillary Clinton years ago. And one of those emails, the subject line being uh, looking for the, 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 the body of uh, Gilgamesh and the buried Nephilim. Uh, I brought this up on another podcast recently and I forget which show it was, but the person had, no idea what i was talking about and i was like you never heard of this i just assume everybody heard of this and so uh like i i pull, it's funny because i forget so many things in my life but i always remember that i have a folder on my phone with the link for this because <laughs> i always at, at, at a moment's notice i want to be able to pull it up and so i'm pulling it up right now just in case somebody in the audience doesn't know uh the the hillary clinton emails that were leaked by WikiLeaks years ago. Uh, what we believe is an alias for Hillary herself. It's a name that popped up a lot in the emails uh, that were on her server. Um, the subject line. All we have is the subject line. We don't have the context. The context of the inter- or the email. The content, I should say. Uh, it's just the subject line. It says requesting documents pertaining to the resurrection chamber of Gilgamesh, the location of his body, and the location of the buried Nephilim. Let's go. What's the government doing? What is what is the government doing? What is somebody in the government doing trying to find this stuff? It's because I think in 2003, when America invaded Iraq, uh, the first stop was the tomb of Gilgamesh. Wow. They, they, this was on the news. They actually, like, this was something that was talked about. Uh, and I believe they actually retrieved that stuff and along with that stuff i believe that they retrieved ancient technology and they've been since 2003 dabbling in new technology that they didn't have access to before i think they had access to other stuff but it was just a whole new branch of it and so um does the government mess with this stuff absolutely uh i think that the government definitely creates these creatures uh, whether it's they're mimicking what's already ex- out there and existing or they're trying to generate something or summoning it summoning it um when i saw living here in east tennessee i live about 30 minutes away from oak ridge which is where they developed the nuclear bomb for world war ii uh they have a particle accelerator just like cern and uh, a lot of weird stuff happens out of there I, I could go on for stories with that but uh i was talking when i moved down here i was talking to a farmer because i i'm a i'm a i'm a small homesteader i got a couple pigs and chickens and i'm looking to get some cows and so when I came down here, I was talking to the different farmers trying to figure out what's going on. And this farmer, he told me that when, so he was around my age, excuse me. And when he uh, was growing up, he said that the old timers would tell him that when they were building Oak Ridge, uh, first of all, nobody knew Oak Ridge was being built. That's why they called it the secret city because nobody knew it was there. And so at that, at that time, when it was being built, the old timers said that they would see these uh, white Bigfoot, these giant Bigfoot creatures that were white in the area. And so it's like, well, what's that? What is that? How does that play into Oak Ridge? Um, could the government be utilizing creatures to guard facilities uh, to deter people? Um, we have in Pennsylvania, Actually, eastern Ohio, up all across northern Pennsylvania, stretching all across the state, there's these legends of a white Bigfoot uh, that people are seeing. There's also legends of the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania, which that takes up at least one sixteenth of the state, having uh, deep underground military bases. So, is there a connection there? I don't know. It's a theory, and I don't know if my cat is bothering you guys. I'm sorry. Is, is the, is, was the uh, was the email? Do you think related to the Kandahar giant? Was that g- thing the Gilgamesh tomb related to that Kandahar giant? Maybe it was related. I'd never really thought about that. I always just viewed those two things as absolutely separate incidences. Um, 
you know, the, the giant aspect in the, uh, in the Middle East is something that I never thought would be so prevalent until I started talking to certain people. Like, I was like, this is wild. I mean, it, it, you hear the Kandahar Giants story and you're like, okay, that's a one-off, right? And it's like, no, this is something that actually happens a lot. Uh, I was talking to a guy who uh, was stationed in Afghanistan. This was years ago, probably like 2018, 2019. And he would go out to the area in the local area, talking to locals, and he would try to bring things up when he could. And, he, you know, it's Afghanistan, so it's, it's shaky as to who you're talking to. Um, but he did find out that he was told that there is, a, I guess, a wildlife refuge that is in Afghanistan that nobody dares to go to because there's giants that live there. And he, he, what he said, which really narrows it down, he said that this refuge actually shares the border with China. And when you look at the map, there's only one small section of Afghanistan that actually shares a border with China. And it is a wildlife refuge. And so when you see it on the map, you're like, shoot, dude, like if that if that area wasn't popping off so crazy, I might get a trip to go over there and do a documentary. Oh, yeah, you know? it goes all the way. It gets snakes, it snakes in this little finger of Afghanistan goes in between all those. Yeah. It, which it's is so also interesting because it's bordered by you know Tajikistan. Uh I would not uh, go there. Would be Pakistan. Right. Tajikistan, Pakistan, and China, I think, it's, are, are, are all bordering that. The yeah, walk, it, 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 I think it's called the, the, propaganda. the Walk-On Corridor Nature Refuge. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, like, Is there like, any roads through it? I don't know. I don't know. But the, the, it's just uh, it, it's one of those things where it, it gave me a very precise location. I'm just like, man, I wish I could go there. I wish I could go there if I was daring, but I'm not that daring. Um, and so, I, you know what? I could probably grow my beard out nice and long and, and, and just tan up real nice because like the Puerto Rican runs strong in my veins. And so like I could probably fit right in. Just oh, yeah, learn, yeah. just learn Arabic, and I'd be good, man. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> you ever uh, miss driving truck? No. No, I used to when I first quit. And I think it was just anxiety of being self-employed on this crazy idea of making making movies and podcasts for a living. Like, it's scary. And so I, I kept my CDL for the longest time. I was like, I could always fall back on that. When I moved to Tennessee, uh, Tennessee basically made the decision for me because I wanted to have my license transferred to Tennessee. And they said to keep my CDL, I'd have to go get a physical and keep up on that for every two years. And I'm like, I ain't doing that. I, I'm, I'm out. And so I just dropped my CDL. I figured if I had to go back to driving truck, I should probably go back to school anyways because the laws here change so much that um, I will have no idea what's legal anyways when I go back into truck. And so I would need a, a, a refresher on that anyways. But no, I don't miss it. Uh, and now I'm at the point where, uh, and I mean this wholeheartedly, uh, I tell my wife, if this, what we're building and what we've built so far all falls apart, whether it's because I did something crazy, stupid, and everybody stopped liking me or, you know, the economy tanks or whatever, um, I am not going back to driving truck. I will sell off everything that I could possibly sell off. I'm going to buy an acre of land and I'm going to put a trailer on it and I'm going to live there and I'm going to farm and I'm going to live very simply. I'm not going to be on in Instagram, social media. I'm just going to disappear. And my life is just going to be very simple. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm just, just going to have my pigs, my couple cows, a lot of chickens, and peace. That's all I want. And so uh, right now we're in the storm. We're building. We're hustling. Um, I was just telling my wife before I came down here to talk to you guys that it, it's funny because perspective is everything. And we get emails from people and they we, we know the perception is, oh, you're just a podcaster. So you just sit down to talk to people. Then you basically, you don't work for a living. Uh, it's easy and it's far from it. And like the, just to get to where I'm at, I, I hustled like crazy. And I told her now it's not the same hustle. It's not the same grind. It's a different grind. It's like I, I said to her, it, it's a different grind. We, it's the same grind, just a different stone we're grinding on. So it's like, I'm not really, uh, my cat is distracting me back there. I'm sorry, but okay. I'm, not, I'm not really like 
grinding in the sense of like staying up all night, producing audio and that stuff, putting that time in for that. It's now running things behind the scenes, being a CEO of a media company that we're trying to build projects and uh, appearing on shows and promoting our, our films and and also at the same time, still doing the podcasting and recording for my show and trying to build everything. So it's just a different grind, but it's still, it's still, you know, putting a lot of work in. And um, if this all fell apart, I don't, I would, I know I wouldn't have the energy to do it over again. I just wouldn't. And so uh, I would just, I would just fade away. I totally get it. I totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'll tell you guys, I, um, I really had a good time out there doing the filming. Um, I'll tell you, we did. We went out to Washington State and shot a Bigfoot film, and we stumbled. It, it's not out yet. Uh, it will be out early next year. Uh, and while we were out there, we stumbled into a missing person case that has a lot of missing four one one vibes. The guy's still missing to this day. Uh, and we 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 might do some extra work on that. To be honest with you. Um, yeah. And then uh, we shot, uh, we actually shot a movie. So Merkel Media is going to have its own first movie next year too. Uh, we called it The Sasquologist. And uh, the, 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 the story, so this is what the great thing is. Like, so I have Joseph who, the, the experience in the industry, he wrote the movie. He also stars as the main character. So it's just the quality is just through the roof for being a first movie. And uh Basically, what it's about is uh, Joseph plays a biologist who is in the Rocky Mountains, and he uh, he found out through his studies or whatever that the Patterson Gimlin film, Patty, her offspring migrates to the Colorado Rockies, and he's tracking down them. And uh, he's out there trying to do all the scientific method, and he comes across this kid who I think he secretly views me as this kid uh and because the kid is just like this woo woo kid he's like bigfoot comes through interdimensional portals and everybody knows it you know and like he's just like there's this clash and he's like kid get away from me and the kid just wants to just come out with him and uh, eventually he lets the kid come out and they have some wild things happening uh but it's it's a very story driven movie where they they through their interactions find out that the way they are has a lot to do with what happened to them in their past with their with growing up and you know a lot of you know dad hurt and things like that uh but it's also a really funny movie it's a comedy um and it's 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 safe for the whole family to view because there's no bigfoot like eating people's heads off it's not like a blood gut score movie uh so it's no a lot of fun mountain stuff no yeah, none of the broke back, back mountain stuff very uh very 20 uh, 2001 2002 family friendly kind of movie you know so uh we uh you know we have a different perspective at merkel media and so uh it is what it is but um i'm really excited about that coming out and then this this movie that we're or this documentary we're shooting in two weeks we're going to the l have you ever heard of the lbo i don't think so what's it called the lbo lbl it stands for land between the lakes it's a uh, it's basically a very large island stretch that goes uh, between Tennessee and Kentucky on the western side of the state. And uh, this island has like a ton of wild things happening in it, specifically Dogman. Uh, I had recently talked to somebody that believes that through their research, they have found up to at least 20 people who have died in the LBL that under the circumstances he believes were done by dogman. Uh, and so we're going out there to hunt the dogman again, in the LBL and, uh, we're doing it the week of Halloween. So we're going to be out there Halloween night, uh, probably in the, one of the graveyards in the LBL. And I wow. think it's supposed to be a full moon. So the only thing I don't have yet is a silver bullet because I gotta, I gotta get a silver. Oh bullet. yeah. 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 Bring it. Bring a wooden stake too, or something. I, yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if it was a full moon as well? And get I know. I, I somebody said it was supposed to be a full moon. I haven't checked into it, but uh, if it is a full moon, that's just icing on the cake, man. Like, that looks I, like a really cool place. There, it's, yeah, it's right in between. It's this green space right in between all that. Yeah, it's yeah. About the map there, that's cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of legend. There's this like really famous story that 
came out. Oh, it's near Hopkinsville too. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We actually got it. We have an Airbnb that we're staying in Hopkinsville. What? Look for caves around that. I know. I know. Dude, we're, we're out there for a week and we don't have enough time to do it all, you know, but what we're planning on doing is spending our nights in the LBL, retreating back to the Airbnb to sleep and uh, going out and doing it again. But during the day, also exploring Hopkinsville. So Maybe we'll have two films shot in one week. I don't know. Uh, it'd be really cool, though. But um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun going out there. Uh, we have uh, we we picked up another cameraman, and so we are going to have two official cameramen. And the new guy that we picked up, he comes with a lot of gear. Like he's been in the industry for a long time, and he's got like close to a hundred thousand dollars worth of gear that he'll be bringing out. I'm just like, you're hired. Like you're, you're absolutely hired. You and me are best friends, you know, but uh, it turns out Joe's really cool. Like he, he actually helped shoot the Sasquologist and on his way back from Colorado, he stopped here in Tennessee to meet with me. Cause I figured it, cause Joseph really liked him. And I was like, if Joseph really likes him, then I should meet him and make sure that, you know, he's going to be a good fit moving forward. And I'm telling you, like the, the dude was a really cool dude. So, uh, I'm really excited about having him as uh, a member of the team. And I got the whole crew coming back again, uh, Joel and his portal hopping. And if we can open a portal in a graveyard on Halloween night with a dog man coming through, perfect. Perfect. Let me know if you need a sidekick for Joel to go through the portal, and I'll get Grandma all revved up again. <laughs> We're going to send him to Antarctica on an expedition once, too, and it turned out to be $54,000 U.S. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time too. I was kind of worried that he wouldn't make it, so it's kind of fucked up. Tony, this has been fantastic. Where can our listeners find all of your stuff? Yeah, I'd say Merkel Dot Media is the one stop shop now. Uh, from there, you can branch out. Uh, Merkel Dot Media has the podcast are on the platform. The films, Exhibition Dogman was the first one. This one is the one we just came out with is The Shape of Shadows. Um, we you can purchase and and rent from there. Uh, and eventually we'd like to have so much stuff going on that we can just basically open up a subscription to the website and people can just get everything that we offer through the subscription base. But, uh, right now it's just uh Merkle dot media is where you can find everything and the confessionals. If you want to listen to my podcast, it's the, the confessionals that's on all the podcast playing apps and, and YouTube for now. Good for you, man. This is great. Yeah. This has been awesome. Keep up the good work, Tony. I feel like it's just a matter of time until we get to hang out in real life. Maybe shoot off some guns. Yeah. Who knows? Okay. But uh it's somebody back. guns. Guns, baby. I'm down. I also have guns. I like them. I like to shoot them. We should we could get together sometime and have a time. I bet Tennessee, I never been there, but it sounds like a little bit like Texas, pretty free. I know a lot of people have been relocating there for that reason. So yeah, yeah, it's it's been great. It's been a great transition. Um, I now have a truck gun because I'm a Tennessean and, uh, the, 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 I was hanging out in the gun range with some guys shooting guns and they're like, what kind of truck gun do you got? And I was like, what's a truck, what's a truck gun? My cat just jumped at me. Uh, and I was, and they're like, you don't have a truck gun. And I'm like, no. And they're like, everybody's got to have a truck gun. I'm like, why? And they're like, in case it pops off, you need to have a truck gun. I'm like, okay. So now I, I have a truck gun. So <laughs> what'd you get? I, I run a, a tactical shotgun for a truck gun. I so I actually found a really good deal on a, a POF Minuteman. And uh that's what I have as my truck gun, which I wouldn't recommend for most people because it's kind of usually pricey, but I got it used and it was it was a good deal. So I was like, I gotta do it. So that's what I did. There you go. Yeah. It's okay. It's worth splurging on because they never go down in value. So yeah. Uh, you can really just sell them within like a week if you need to for more than you bought them for. Yep, exactly. And ammo. Ammo's going to be going up in price very soon. Oh, yeah, exactly. I was like, dude, I've said I was stockpiling when people were calling me crazy. And then they're like, fuck, fucking 270 hasn't been in for a year and a half. I'm like, yeah, I know. I got a thousand of them, though, motherfucker. So I don't give a fuck. Yeah, they're like, can I get some? You're like, nope. Uh, no. <laughs> This has to last me. From my perspective, this might have to last me the rest of my life. You know, whenever I see it, if I see it and there's 10 boxes, that shit's my, fine. It's going yeah, into yeah. the stockpile because it just never gets cheaper. Yeah. No, it's just going to be more expensive and less less uh, available. Uh, they, they've already been putting a, a lot of restrictions on the production side of things. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But if you can buy it, buy it now. Buy it now. 
Right on, Tony. This has been great. You have yourself a wonderful night and be careful with that cat. Nice. I know. She's crazy. She's crazy right now. But I appreciate it, guys. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Take care. See you. And that was a chat with the one and only Tony Merkel. What'd you think? Oh, that was fantastic. I can't believe it's been this long. We haven't had him on yet. It does seem crazy. I was on Union with him way back when. I think we'll be on uh, together again soon this Monday, maybe. So Monday? Yeah. I haven't been on Union in a long time. There's yeah. always just so many people, you know. The last time I logged in, I was there for like five minutes. I didn't even say anything. I was like, yeah, fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> international man i just you know it's like uh oh yeah I, told I get distracted too easily and then they call me and i don't know what the fuck's going I told on you. <laughs> you're like huh, huh, huh? <laughs> big thanks tony for coming on the show big thanks to you guys for listening even bigger thanks if you're one of the one or two percent that choose to support the great work here in Grimerica. america sign up today over at america.ca slash support you can do a monthly you can do a one-time donation you know, it's, you do a buck a month, two bucks a month, five bucks a month, whatever the fuck you want to do. We will love you for it. Uh, you can cover to GrimericaOutlaw.ca. Check out that podcast. We have uh, the Adult Brain podcast, AdultBrain.ca. And uh, that's it. That's all we got. We got trips. So contact at thecabin.com. Spam, spam gram, gramicamerica.com, CA, both work. And there's a chance. America.ca slash chats. Join that too. And there's a telegram. That's just uh, whatever telegram is, Grand America. It's in the show notes. T.me. It's in the show notes. Yeah. All right. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. I'm walking gingerly through the rat race. Take a look at the big old smile on my face. Kicking around down by. Narcissists, the people are many, they preen themselves, oh how they navel gaze. Somewhere over that hill, the gloomy skies cease to exist. I'm climbing that hill, I pass by and pity the poor Sisyphus. I go into hyperdrive, turn into a beam of light. I'm strolling down a static electric avenue. The people are predictable, they say, good morning, how do you do? When out of nowhere, a randomly pure angel in the crosswalk bumps into me. And in doing so, knocks all the evil and all the wind out of me. And it's black as tar, ugly as ever, and of no apology. This angelic mama sings heavenly of the truest theology. Together we're a seraphim dream, forever young with no chronology. A thousand years from now, we'll be written into ancient mythology. We go into hyperdrive, turn into a beam of light. Can you tell me about the view up there? It's sparkling remarkably, the air is crystal clear. Well, please won't you tell me what it takes to transcend this place? A little bit of heart and a whole lot of soul. Take a look at the big old smile on my face. As my angel says, dance with me and your life will never, ever, ever be told. I go into hyperdrive, turn into a beam of light. 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 Turn into a beam of light.